hopefully for those who are in on the recording, uh, you'll be able to see uh, maybe the, uh, the passage we've just had read out. Uh, and we'll be looking at some others in a few moments. So one of the things in this first, the first three uh, verses of Exodus 3, uh, I tend to notice is the, the kind of interplay between the, the angel and the Lord. Um, and I don't know whether that's something maybe you've noticed, uh, but uh, first of all, we're told the angel of the Lord appeared, but then the angel has something named disappears from the text and it just becomes God the Lord. Uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's kind of interesting in itself is this interplay of angel and the Lord. Um, it's often interpreted uh, by a lot of commentators down through the centuries, actually, uh, as a way of thinking about the, that God, in a sense, created a, th this is my way of putting it, a human divine interface, a kind of uh, uh, GUI, as it were, for for this particular uh, thing to take place, uh, rather than the angel being a sentient being as such, it's just a vehicle uh, for God's communication with Moses uh, at this point. But it's it's the association with the flame and the fire that I think catches our imagination in it. So that's uh, one of the things just to that you might be able to uh, think about in the background there. More centrally, uh, the motif of blazing but not consumed and uh, some of you will have rem uh, noticed that uh, I'd called entitled this uh, the unburning bush or something of that nature and uh, the unburning in that was uh, because I became aware in doing some uh, reflecting and reading around this that in the orthodox churches um, it's called the unburnt bush rather than the burning bush uh, and I liked the fact that, that draws attention to the not consumed part of the story, uh, whereas uh, the Western naming doesn't particularly enable us to hear that. So the unburning bush is what I've gone for as a, a mixed title there. Um, but it's an iconic sort of image. Um, one of the other images I quite liked that I just go, I haven't I decided not to go with it, but is one where it's quite clear that the uh, in the way that it's portrayed that the bush has green leaves on it even though the flames are you know well uh, consuming it would be otherwise consuming it so uh, that makes the point as well so it's blazing but it's not consumed and some of you may be aware that that this image of the unburning bush as i'm calling it is a symbol used for a lot of reformed churches throughout the world uh, and that's uh, actually come out of uh, the, the sense uh, after the St. Bartholomew Day's Massacre in France, Day's Massacre, sorry, in France, uh, of Calvinist Christians. Um, the, it, the burning bush symbolised to them and then to other Reformed people the fire of persecution that they'd undergone, and yet the, their, uh, their expression of their Christian faith remained and in a sense was unconsumed it was still there uh, so they adopted it as their symbol for that and i think that's worth keeping in mind as well uh, in terms of our own uh, reflecting on activism i'll say a bit more about that a bit later on and finally the other thing on for this section of the thing i think would be interesting to look at is the uh, the way that moses called Moses, Moses, and it reminds me of uh, other incidents in scripture, this kind of double naming of the person being addressed. And then the, here I am, uh, the Hebrew is Hineni, which uh, I just love. It it's, comes loads and loads of times in the, the Hebrew Bible. But one of the, the things that uh, this reminds me of uh, in most immediately is uh, Abraham and the, what's called in Hebrew, the Akedah, the binding of A uh, Isaac. Um, and where you've got the same sort of calling out of a bush, so to speak, uh, taking place. But in the case of the binding of Isaac, it's a bush that isn't burning, although the offering that is in the bush is later burnt. Uh, I just find that imaginatively interesting. I haven't managed to go anywhere particularly with it, but I'll leave it there just in case it works for you. Um, but it's that sense that this, this uh, incident 
isn't it has these resonances with other things that take place and uh, it's taking place in a wilderness as well you know the wilderness is where interesting things happen in uh, in the hebrew uh, scriptures but i also like this hineni this sense of uh, saying here i am to god's call um, it's something that uh, a group of us uh, in the uh, borrowed time project where we've been doing something called cloud and fire uh, together in the end partly after the discussions we had our final closing liturgy this was one of the phrases we picked up and used as a way of uh, each of us recognizing our own calling before god in climate emergency and in a sense to say you know i'm here to pick up the calling that you're laying on me so uh, yeah we might like to return to that hineni here i am uh, in a, in a little while okay that said i think i'd like to move us on so the next bit of uh, of exodus chapter three god said further i am the god of your father the god of abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings. And I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. I have, I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And again, I'll just give us a minute or so just to sit with that bit of the reading. So if I could cut in on your thoughts just for a little while again. I'm first struck with, I have observed the misery. I've observed the sufferings. And I'm thinking it's worth remembering why Moses is there and not in Egypt at this point. Uh, he is effect, in effect in exile following having murdered an Egyptian. Uh, the murder was motivated by a desire to defend his oppressed people. That's the most generous reading of, of it. Uh, Moses uh, is recalled, in a sense, to his earlier concern, the one that exiled him in this. Perhaps uh, recalled to something that he had well put behind him at this point and never thought to re revisit. Um, but he's called now not to impulsive violence, not that he was called to that in the first place, but that was how he responded to the concern that God is now saying God shares with Moses. But rather now, uh, this is the start of a call to join God's mission at the, the right time, the Kairos moment. And I think that's significant. And I would like to just underline that. And uh, again, we'll return to something of that a bit later. The other thing I reflect on as I read this bit as well is that uh, in relation to our concerns in climate action, uh, 
Um, I think it's legitimate to uh, expand the misery of the people of God, uh, if you like, uh, in terms of the way that we think about that, uh, into thinking about the misery of God's creation. I think we know that God is concerned about the whole creation and not simply about one particular people at a moment of oppression in history uh, uh, three and a half thousand years ago or whatever. So I think it's legitimate for us to hear, in a sense, God saying, I am, you know, I've observed the misery of my creation. And I've heard their cry on account of, I've heard its cry on account of its taskmasters. That's us. Another thing that I think about as I'm reading this part of the passage, um, I don't know about you, but certainly uh, part of uh, what I've heard down through the years as being part of various Christian churches uh, is a phrase, the need constitutes the call, i.e., you know, if you see a, a need in your community or whatever, then that's, that's your call to go and fulfil it. And I kind of feel that Moses, uh, maybe in this passage, gives the lie to that. And certainly in terms of the, the reflection I gave earlier about, you know, why is he here? It's because he saw the need, felt in a sense, perhaps it constituted the call, and it didn't. It ended up in, with him in exile and running from the law, so to speak, or at least from Pharaoh. So maybe the need doesn't constitute the call. And there's a question to me, therefore, about uh, about all sorts of things, but in terms of climate action as well. So how well centred are we in a sense of God's call for the action that we, we get involved with? How far um, are we, though, perhaps distracted into chasing what we see as needs, rather than to borrow an image from one of the Psalms, look to the eye of God to direct us? That's not to say we shouldn't be doing any of this stuff. It's just to say, for each of us, what is our call? I'm also interested in that phrase, I know their sufferings. Um, some ancient commentators uh, see the earlier uh, picture of the uh, God calling from out of the bush as symbolizing, uh, putting in symbol form what this, this phrase is saying, uh, that it's a symbolization of God's oppressed people. And it's, you know, things like, you know, the thorns on the bush, which it's a, the word is probably means more of a thorny sort of bush. Uh, and uh, so seeing the thorns and the fire as symbolizing the suffering uh, of the God's oppressed people. So it's, as it were, God calling out of the oppression. And if we take that to the creation, widen it to the creation, as I suggested earlier, that's kind of um, interesting to reflect on further. And that word in there as well, no. I know their sufferings towards the end of verse seven. And it's, the, uh, it's a frequent verb in Hebrew, yada, and uh, it's used quite a lot. And it's um, the word used for that kind of an Adam knew Eve, you know, it's that, uh, uh, it's, it has a, a kind of sense of not just knowing a fact, but actually having a heart uh, gut sort of knowledge of something. Uh, compassion might be the right sort of word to put in uh, in connection with it. Suffering with, that's what compassion means, literally, uh, suffering with. And I reflect as I think about that, that uh, a few times in the gospel, Jesus is described as ministering out of compassion. He looked at the crowd, for instance, with compassion. He looked at the rich young ruler uh, in that sort of a way.
And perhaps some of us know at least some of the suffering of creation in that kind of a way. Let that be at the heart of our response. So I'll just give us another minute before I move on to the next bit of the the next part of the passage. So now I'm going to read uh, the next part, Exodus 3, 10 to 12. God said, so come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. So again, just a a minute or so to sit with that passage before I say anything else. So one of my comments, one of the things I notice again in this is this uh, uh, in, is an interplay between the question that uh, Moses asks, who am I to, to do this? And effectively the response is, I will be with you. And it seems to me that this kind of uh, call and re- uh, response uh, in, in reverse uh, happens quite a lot in scripture. Excuse me, sorry about that. And uh, it's not, yeah, it's not unusual in scripture to find this this kind of sense of unworthiness with God meets that with, in a sense, I will be with you in one way, in some shape, way, shape, or form. And uh, perhaps it resonates for us. Who am I, little me, to, to try and do anything about this? But that sense of I will be with you, if it's God's call to us, I will be with you, is uh, what is said there. And uh, I, th- you'll notice there's a little bit of Hebrew I stuck in the middle of the passage there. That was partly why, for, w- for when I was thinking about it, I, I got to thinking, now, does that really fit with what I'm uh, thinking here? But uh, it does. Um, that um, naming of uh, that relates that we relate to jesus of uh, emmanuel god with us uh, it's the same root words in there uh, in, indeed so it's uh, it kind of put me in mind of the god being with us kind of thing in the in the prom- prophetic promises that are fulfilled in christ god with us And the other thing I reflect on as I uh, read this passage is that uh, is the word for worship there. It's so easy for us Western Christians, I think, to hear the word worship and think of uh, something happening in a building, uh, musicians, 
some kind of uh, ceremony, perhaps, and uh, you know something basically that goes on for an hour or so in a in a building. That's often what we hear when we hear or read the word worship. The Hebrew word is abad, which means to serve. Um, so it's, uh, you know, uh, you will serve God on this mountain. I think one or two uh, translations do actually have that. And I think this is significant. There are two things this links with for me, which you may find uh, you might like to, to reflect on as well. One of those is this word abad is used in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 2. And it's what the Adam is supposed to do with the garden. He's supposed to serve it and keep it. Abad is the word there to serve the, uh, the, the creation, if you like, the garden. So that's one of the things that comes to my mind in, when I see this word. The other thing that comes to mind is Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it describes what uh, worship is. Uh, at heart in Paul's view there, which is about offering our bodies as living sacrifices. That is our spiritual worship. Uh, and it therefore reclaims the, the word worship from uh, just being kind of cultic thing, let's say, um, a service you know, of, a, of a limited duration with a particular set of limited actions to something that we do with our whole lives. So, it, I'm just reminded as I read this, you shall worship God on this mountain. What happens on the mountain? They're given the commandments. That's a whole life thing that's, uh, that begins at that. Their, their worship is their service, the service of the whole people, which includes a service to the creation, as many of you are no doubt aware. And this is done in response to God's call. And it's done in God's presence and God's spirit, the I will be with you. It's not just a need constitutes the call thing, as I was noticing earlier. So I'm just going to give us another minute or so just to reflect on the passage a bit further, perhaps in uh, some of the things I've said may help take your reflection a wee bit further. So I'm going to risk interrupting your thoughts again. I hope it's not too much of a crash to read the very final bit that I'd like us to reflect on today. Verses 13 to 14. Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. So again, I'll just give us a minute or so to reflect quietly, formulate your own questions or observations, notice what it is that maybe uh, presses upon you from that passage.
So uh, just a few things to notice here, uh, and perhaps some of them are things that have kind of bugged you as well. Um, this, this is meant to be one of the passages where God, uh, where, about God's name, really. Some of you will be familiar that quite often in a number of Bible versions where it's got, in, uh, in the Hebrew section, it's got, uh, uh, in English, L-O-R-D, the Lord, in capital letters. That often is standing for the uh, the four letters of the Hebrew that are used and often translate, uh, said as Adonai, Lord. Uh, but in fact, uh, in the Jerusalem Bible, it's Yahweh, which is probably closer. But we don't really know how it was uh, pronounced because the vowels aren't in there and uh, Jewish uh, readers of the Torah stopped pronouncing it um, out of reverence. So we've really no idea. <laughs> Uh, that's just the best guess, Yahweh. Um, so that's meant to be the name of God. Uh, it's the one Jehovah's Witnesses uh, try and pick up and uh, claim as the name of God, but they're, they're actually just using the vowels uh, that uh, of the word Adonai, which is what uh, Hebrew readers often substitute when they come across these four letters. Uh, so it's an odd one, though. Uh, so it's not we don't know how it pronounced. It's pronounced. What we do have in the text is uh, the Hebrew words for I am who I am, or it could be translated I will be who I will be. The tense is kind of a bit fluid. Echye uh, asher echye. So you can hear from that that echye doesn't really sound like Yahweh, except just a little bit. Uh, it's a bit of a spurious etymology, in my view to say that this is uh, the name of God. Uh, it isn't really, it's just one of those kind of things that's grown up around it, I think. Uh, but that phrase, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be, is, is definitely worth reflecting on further. Yahweh may have, probably has a separate etymology. Uh, it probably goes back to uh, a word in Midian, Midianite or something like that. This is my view anyway. Uh, which means the jealous one, the one who loves loves jealously, as it were, which is quite nice. But uh, yeah, so what uh, what is it about this name, God's own naming of God's own being? Um, well, I, I notice in the passage there's a kind of anchoring to the history. The God of your ancestors uh, is uh, what the first thing picked up, and we know that kind of. You know, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob is quite a, a refrain through the Hebrew scriptures. Um, so there is a, a, a relating to what um, people already know, uh, something of their own history. Before there's a, a kind of new naming given if it is indeed what it is. And this new name or phrase uh, that designates God uh, seems to me to hint at a greater than status of Yahweh uh, in relation to, and I think this could be the crucial thing, the gods of the Egyptians. A number of you may know that the uh, plagues uh, seem to, each one takes a, uh, a pop at a different he, uh, Egyptian deity. Uh, so uh, it may well be that in saying, I am who I am, it's kind of claiming a, a you know, bigger status, a bigger sense of being, as it were, than the, the more limited uh, Egyptian uh, pantheon. And they're about to be deposed. So this I am is kind of a, a, a claim of, of greaterness, if you like. That's my view. The other thing I'd like to reflect on, though, in relation to this bit of the passage, uh, is something called the fifth mark of mission. I hope a number of you will have heard of it, but I can't, I won't presume that you do. Um, the fifth mark of mission. Um, a number of churches, the Anglican Church among them, have uh, this kind of recognition that mission has five dimensions to it, if you like, five marks. Uh, and one of the, the fifth mark is, uh, well, you could sum it up as creation care, that we have, that God sends us into the world to, to look after the created order. 
That's part of the mission that we have. God sends Christ followers to care for creation. Uh, the fourth mark is actually a, a recognition that we are called collectively as a church to strive for social justice. Uh, and it's, it's actually a, a fairly explicit recognition that that sometimes requires, if you like, action that's, uh, that might be called activism, that might be called political. And I think actually we should in a sense hold these two together as we know that they should be. Creation care and social justice are not unrelated. And if these marks of mission are calling us to take action uh, for in the political realm for social justice, then taking action in the political realm, being active for uh, creation care, I think is well within you know, the, the bounds of that. And it's, uh, it's within, it's, it's God's call upon us, I think, uh, to do that. So I've been thinking too, with the whole of the passage that we've had, that, uh, that our call to be fifth mark missionaries, as I, I, I'm calling it in my own head nowadays, uh, is part of what we're, this is about. I would argue, if we're going to hear this for ourselves today. And I would like, therefore, to link that back to the uh, a theme from a little bit earlier, burning but not consumed. As activists, as people called in various ways to be activism, uh, activists, we know that burnout is a danger. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why this passage and the central image of the unburning bush uh, works for me or is so uh, resonant for me is a sense that it, it offers an implicit contrast of um, burning which leads to a burning out because it's not rooted in the call of God and uh, God you know a real sense that we will go because God is with us that kind of uh, state of being which I think leaves us vulnerable to burnout uh, so that's the contrast. But the, what we are being called to is to be so rooted in, the, in God and God's call to us that, uh, that we may burn, but without being consumed. And I think that's, in a sense, the opposite of burnout. Uh, so I guess for me, that would be my, my parting kind of thought uh, coming out of this passage, which I hope summarizes some of the things uh, that I've, I've mentioned in that.